the podium because ain't nobody done it yet. All right. Also, I just want to take the time to thank Mary and Ruth and all of like White October for this like really cool day we've been a part of. Yes. Yes. Um, speaking at Lead Dev is like a highlight of my year, and attending also is a highlight of my professional year. So, thank you for the thoughtfulness and the care. All right. Hello. I'm Doretti. Hi. Um, I have my first name every place on the internet, but Snapchat, because like some 19-year-old has it. Um, <laughs> I'm mostly on Twitter, where you'll find me posting nonsense, um, and maybe these slides afterwards, um, which is fun for me, nonsense. I don't know if y'all want to be a part of that. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, like Mary said, I've been a technologist for over a decade. I'm currently a staff engineer at MailChimp, gang gang. Um, <laughs> Uh, and before that, I worked at Slack, and before that, I worked at Fastly, and then before that, marketing agencies that nobody knows about. I studied English in college, and all that means is that I used to really love to read, and now I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, I also have a on hiatus podcast called Snack Overflow, but maybe I'll relaunch it in 2020. Um, and I've gotten really into plants lately, which is very millennial, and I have like calendar reminders to what are the plans? They're very soothing. And I'm here today to talk to you about making good trouble. Um, to me, uh, this is a pure thing that I got from John Lewis, who is a US congressman and um, civil rights activist. And he's been telling young people for decades to get in trouble, cause good trouble, put yourself in the way, and that's how change gets made. So let's talk about changing our workplaces. With that in mind, um, I'm here to talk to you about changing your workplace, but I'm also here to talk to you about the cost of caring. Mm. But first, a disclaimer. Um, with my talks, I like to give shadow sides, um, the pros and the cons. I can't tell you how much bad advice I've received in my life. Um, and I don't want to sort of pass that along, especially because sometimes people will give advice based on a situation, and you know, all situations are not the same. So, firstly, don't do this work if you're not senior enough. Don't. Um, you'll seem like you're skipping ahead, and this talk is mainly about glue work, and if you've seen Tanya Riley's talk about glue work, it's amazing. She gave it at Lead Dev New York, so the talks are already up on the internet. If you have some time, watch it. It's worth every second. Um, and Tanya recommends to not do glue work if you're not senior enough, or considered highly technical. I also do not recommend doing this work if your organization does not value it. I've been lucky to work in places that are highly collaborative with lots of really nice people and good peers and colleagues, um, and that is a necessary starting condition. If your organization doesn't value change, this is wasted effort. Don't do it. <laughs> Uh, more than that, what is your super senior tier doing? Um, that's how you know if your organization values it. Um, your principal engineers, your senior staffs, whoever's at the top of your ladder, um, and who's getting promoted, what's on the walls. Uh, Netflix has this really interesting culture and responsibility doc, if you've, it's a kind of thing that's been floating around the valley for years, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, and they have this one gem that I find to be very interesting, which says that the real company values as opposed to the nice sounding ones, are the ones that are shown by who gets rewarded, who gets promoted, and who gets let go. So, for changing your org, are people getting promoted for doing this work? If not, that might be all you need to know. <laughs> uh, now, changing your workplace means digging in, it means getting involved, it means getting engaged, and caring more about work can be a capitalist trap. You know. Um, it can take more than it can give, um, and it depends on what kind of person you are. I'm the kind of person that can't help but get involved in things. Maybe you have better boundaries than I do. <laughs> you know, working on it. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you have to remember that passion is not a renewable resource. Um, it runs hot, but it doesn't burn clean. It's not sustainable. Um, so if you're investing in a place that doesn't reciprocate, it can probably take time off your life, like the asterisk, there's no studies about this. Um, but make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Because at the end of the day, 
you're the one that's going to be pushing this forward. Um, are you taking care of yourself? Are you drinking water? Are you sleeping enough? Are you eating in the way that's good for you? Uh, taking care of yourself is paramount because this kind of work is tiring, and it takes a lot of focus and dedication to push through. All right, that's all the disclaimers. <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to have you walk into a fire. Um, here's some recommended reading. A lot of the information from this talk comes from Rebels at Work and a little bit from Leadership BS. Um, Rebels at Work is like a seminal text if you are trying to cause trouble at work. It will show you how to do it safely. Here's the agenda. Um, we're going to talk about how the workplace is kind of broken. <laughs> um, how we should change things anyway, and then some anecdotal data from my own life to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. The workplace, it's just broken. Have you been at work? Like, it's called work for a reason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> workplaces are um, not great. Awesome places are the exception, not the rule. Uh, lots of places where you work don't have a lot of autonomy. You don't get to choose what you work on unless you're very senior. Um, a lot of workplaces don't follow their own rules or processes. Um, ways to work together can vary. Your career can stall. There's lots of bias, like y'all have been at work before. Um, here are some stats. So this is from a survey of 30,000 people worldwide, and 28 to 56% of people want to leave their job like right now. <laughs> That's so much. I get it, working sucks. 30% um, <laughs> of the US workforce is actively disengaged, where 20% is actively spreading discontent. <laughs> like, yeah, like we stand a petty employee, like you're going around spreading rumors, like whatever. 35% um, of people would forego a raise to see their boss fired. <laughs> Just like, you need to know. <laughs> uh, people are unhappy with their managers, and there's that adage that says that people leave managers and not like the workplace. Uh, and that's because the blast rate of leaders and managers is so high. One of two <laughs> leaders is considered ineffective. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's wild. That's like, you know, that's pretty wild. Um, and then uh, Jeffrey Pfeiffer goes on to say that. Um, Workplaces are often toxic environments for the people working in them and for the employers themselves. And um, I like how he talks. He just says what's real and what's not popular. Um, moreover, uh, what's good for the individual is not always good for the group. And in a lot of cases, leaders can focus on what's good for them as opposed to what's good for everyone. Um, for example, Dick Costello used to run Twitter. Um, I think this is like a joke tweet, but he, this actually happened. Um, <laughs> he like started as CEO and like he, and he was CEO for a while. This is like from 10 years ago, but still. Um, so why am I talking about leadership? Um, it's because changing your workplace is leadership work, and you'll be met with resistance. Um, in my own case, uh, you know the. I'm, I'm black, I'm a woman, um, and there's a lot of extra scrutiny, um, which can you know, lead to people perceiving my performance as um, less good. I can earn less money. I can even lose my job. It's very serious. Um, women and minorities are penalized for promoting things like diversity or initiatives they care about. Um, one set of studies suggests that it's risky for low-status group members to help others like them. Um, and so what that can mean is that women and other minorities can choose not to advocate for each other when they get into positions of power because they don't want to be perceived as incompetent or poor performers. So it's going to be some work. Um, this matters because software is proliferating everywhere and everything. What we make matters, how we make matters. And then when companies, you know, take a hit or take the L, it can often be because of bad leadership, and it usually affects employees first. And there's always some new article in the news about how leaders create toxic environments and it hurts their employees. I'm sure there's an article right now on the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> there probably is. Uh, anyway, uh, this kind of work won't be easy. It takes time, dedication, and persistence. Um, if you've ever tried to get more than four people to decide where to go to dinner, you are familiar 
with what it's like to get people to do anything, let alone changing your workplace. Okay, so it's gonna be tough, let's do it anyway. Great. Um, this is a framework called The Four Tendencies. It's created by Gretchen Rubin. Um, Rubin is an American lawyer by training, but she's turned into an author where she's primarily focused on things like um, happiness, habits, and human nature. Um, the Four Tendencies hopes to answer the question, how do I get people, including myself, to do what I want? Um, upholders just want to know what needs to be done. Obligers need accountability. Rebels want freedom to do what they want, and questioners want justifications. I'm an obliger. Um, and for a long time, it's how I thought about responsibility. Like, I would do things if there was an external stimuli, otherwise, why would I? It takes a lot of energy to do anything. Um, life is exhausting. Uh, but then I read Rebels at Work, and I realized that I was actually a rebel. Um, and it means that you decide to keep speaking up and keep trying to push things forward despite the costs. Um, and Carmen Medina and Lois Kelly have this framework for how you can decide if you're a rebel. Um, you tend to be more organized around creating possibilities and achieving certainty. You see emerging trends early, you're thinking several steps ahead, or you come from a different background or culture, and so you bring different ways of thinking into the workplace. That's me. I don't care about ping pong or nice snacks. I want well-oiled machines. I want work to be nice. That's all I care about. Um, I often think about how things are going to play out six months from now. Um, I've always worked ahead, and I'm a black lady in technology, and there are like four of us. <laughs> so I'm different. Um, also, this is a word. Like, whew, um, being a minority or a woman significantly increases the chances that you can be a rebel at work, um, because while companies make space for people who are different, they don't often make space for their perspectives. So what do Medina and Kelly recommend? They recommend that you first gain credibility, because you can't do anything without it. So here's how, to, here's how they say that you should increase your credibility. You need to increase your credibility with your boss, your colleagues, and yourself. So being credible means you have to win your boss over. They have a whole host of things that they are worried about, including politics, and you have to pitch them wins. Uh, your colleagues are your natural allies because they also want things to be nice, and they also kind of see the things that you see. Um, and the more we collaborate with people, the stronger ideas become. Plus, you have to follow through. You can't just do cool projects because they're cool. You have to honor your responsibilities and cultivate a reputation of getting things done. And in that way, you can go from being a troublemaker to a change maker. Um, you can't fight every fight. You have to pull in some of your favorite people to say what you can't. Um, you have to decide if you want the outcome or if you want the credit. Sometimes you just want the thing done. You have to decide what's more important to you. Um, you also need to navigate your actual workplace. Oftentimes, we can't change the culture or the politics or the norms of where we work. We can, however, learn our organization's environment well enough to navigate it. Um, so what does that mean? It means, what does your organization actually value? Are there any sore spots? Is your company mission-driven? Is it more consumer-centric? Um, does it actually value feedback? I don't know. Um, how are decisions made? Are, um, is there one real decision-maker? Who's the Kim Kardashian of your office? Who's influencing people? Who's getting things done? Figure out who you need to befriend. Um, how long do executives stay in their positions? Uh, do decisions take a long time? Do they happen at all? When does budget and headcount come into play? Because that maybe you need more people with you. Uh, learn how to, to time your decisions. Uh, we've talked a lot today about how important communication is. It is fully a superpower, um, and it's step one to getting people on board because humans love a story. That's what we're here today for. Um, you can do a, a couple of things to make your story more compelling. You can appeal to your listener's um, self-interest. You can frame your idea in terms of what that person cares about and what they want. You can spin a story of what could be. Um, people aren't rational actors. Stories take hold in people's minds. You, know? um, you can tell them a story of your future world because you can see it because you are 
you know, seeing your future thinking, your six months ahead. Um, show that the idea can work. Don't lie, because that's not great. Um, but show the milestones. Be buttoned up. Have a plan. Um, anticipate ways that people are going to poke holes in your idea so your idea gets better. People support ideas that they think can work. And finally, take care of yourself. Um, you can't win every battle. Um, work is how people define themselves, I think, a lot these days. Um, but you have to remember, it's just work. Um, in terms of finding the right manager, you have to ask the right question. You should ask your manager, um, how do you treat people who question approaches that might not be you know, effective or maybe have uh, alternate ways of doing things? Um, changing things at work requires the effort of many, many people, and you won't be effective on your own. It's not just you on a crusade. You need to bring other people along with you. Um, and sometimes your ideas won't land. Um, you have to take a step back and wait for your org to catch up, because you kind of are in the future, right? Um, and there is a fine line between advocacy and obsession. Um, <laughs> very fine. Um, are you resting? If you're tired and you're burnt out, you're only going to see problems instead of opportunities. Um, in my case, I'm fairly charismatic, and um, when I'm rested, things are great, everything's great, love it. When I'm not rested, everything's terrible, rain cloud, this place sucks, I'm done. Um, and I can transmit this feeling into like dozens of people. Like Emotional contagion is real. Especially as leaders, we have to be kind of cognizant of that. Um, this is my friend, Dio. Uh, he always says that everything trends towards entropy. Um, software is never finished. Work is never finished. It takes sustained effort and energy to make things nice. So if you want to, say, launch an engineering blog, you have to remember that change is something that needs to consistently be fed and cared for. And you have to take that into account when you're pitching your idea. Also, at the end of the day, remember, Tony Morrison has told us, you are the person you are, you're not your work. So if it doesn't go great, like, that's fine. Next. OK, let's talk some exa examples. And these are examples from my own working life. And I think they've happened in the last like 18 months. I love this quote. The plural of anecdote is data. I love it. Um, feel free to use that in your life. Um, <laughs> So um, when it comes to changing things at work, I have to interrogate why I want to change things. And for me, the answer is twofold. One, this tweet really resonated with me. Um, as leaders, we have to speak up. We are paid for our expertise. So if you're not going to push to make things better, like, why are you doing this job? Um, obviously, there's a time and a place for everything. Um, but like Mary said this morning, don't be a bystander. Secondly, my parents immigrated to America in the 80s, and what that means is that their love language is critique. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So that means my relationship to critique is that it's a loving action. Plus, I'm a mouthy broad, and I love talking, so it's not like you could stop me. Um, and that's my dad, and he's the best. Uh, cool, so let's talk about some things that I changed. Um, for a number of years, I ran the back-end community of practice at Slack. Um, what I had observed was that their front-end team was like super cohesive. They're all like, yeah, React, like, let's go. Um, and they were more in step with each other technically. On the back-end side, I observed that we were having a lot of difficulty making decisions together. And it felt hard and brittle to change anything. So what did I do? I planned an offsite. I don't recommend this. It's <laughs> I planned to. Like, it was like, don't do that. Um, but it was really useful. Uh, the offsite was only ICs, like, no managers allowed. We we're like, in our clubhouse. And it was a specific, <laughs> we were. And it was a specific space to discuss actual issues. Um, so we had a lot of things come out of that. Like, we revamped our onboarding. We added our RFC process. We became an actual community. We had a mentorship program that came out of it. Like, so many working groups. And it became kind of a vibrant community where we were actually able to talk to each other and make decisions for the health of the, of the back end. Um, I got some super great pairs about it, so I'm going to show you now. Um, people felt really connected, because people are trying to connect at work, right? And so. Um, and also cross-functionally as well. Um, this feedback I didn't love as much because I like, do it every six months, and I was like, I almost died, but OK. 
Um, but at the same time, people did recognize the value. Um, I think code review is difficult in any organization. Um, I have a lot of opinions about code review, so come find me. I will talk your ear off about it. Um, but code review was identified as like a major blocker in back-to-back -back engineering surveys. Like just, oh, code review here sucks. Um, so I spun up a working group to work on it. Um, so we spun up a working group, we came up with an RFC, and then nothing happened. <laughs> um, and in my sort of post-mortem of what went down, um, I stumbled across this blog post about how to make changes at work when you don't have any formal authority. And I really, I do recommend this post if you, um, the link is there. Um, but what it just, the blog post distills into this graphic, which is you have to like iterate locally on a process, document it. So we iterated, we're like, yes, we want to do this. We documented it. And then we shared the documentation when we should have mandated. We should have just changed our code review tool to like mandate what we wanted to have happen as opposed to hoping people would just take on the change themselves. Um, I was also <laughs> involved in um, revamping back and hiring at Slack. Um, we were having a hard time feeling like we were competitive in the space. Um, people were able to turn around job offers very quickly and we were not able to compete as well because um, of how long our take home uh, took. So we changed how we did the, the take home um, and revamped the hiring process completely. Um, I developed and trained like 40 engineers on our new onsite. Um, so it was like a live programming assessment as opposed to a take home. Um, we hit our goals for the year. Recruiting was like, this is amazing, um, and started to influence the way other orgs started to hire. Um, candidates really liked it. They thought it was thoughtful. They thought it was, you know, actually tested what they knew and felt like the kind of thing that you would do at work, which was super great because we're not trying to trick people. We just want to assess how, what their skill set is. Um, but this didn't come without a cost, right? Um, changes were made, um, and each of these initiatives took about six to 12 months, and I did this all while being on a feature team and shipping code. So, what was the cost? I was sick a lot. <laughs> um, probably more in the last 12 months than I've ever been. Um, I worked a lot, and I burnt myself out. I still think the effort was worth it, um, because I, you know, I wanted to feel my limits, I guess. Um, but would I make the same choice again? Probably, I mean probably, but I'm not sure. Um, okay, so the TLDR. Uh, changing your workplace is work. Changing your workplace is leadership. It will be really difficult. Um, and there's no perfect end state. All we can do is hope for a little bit better than we did yesterday. <coughs> and it's okay to worry about yourself if you need to. Um, 